podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree the podcast is brought to you by the Lindstrom Law Firm for wills, trusts, probates, and business law. Call 469 515 2559 or visit lindstromlawfirm.com for a free consultation. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan. Welcome to another episode. This one, number 272 of Third Degree, the podcast. I'm Peter, joined by, first off, our favorite beardish Englishman, Bangers and Mash fan, Dan Crook. Howdy, Dan. Do you love some Bangers and Mash, but not as much as Beans on Toast. That is the top <laughs> echelon of British culinary delights. <laughs> I'll have to come over and you'll have to make it for me sometime. Uh, and your hero, my hero, everybody's hero, editor, founder, thirddegree.net, original soccer influencer, and checking in from somewhere in this amazing country uh, with dodgy internet connection, Buzz Carrick. Come in, Buzz, literally. Yeah, I think technically I'm in Montana, but I'm not 100% sure that that's the case. Oh. And I'm sitting at an RV park, so you may hear trucks drive by or dogs bark or people come over and say hello in the middle and ask me if I'm doing what I'm doing. So we'll see how it goes. All right. Yes. Well, we're going to give this the good old college try because uh, your internet connection is shady at best. And we're going to try to work through this so that we can get it over with and actually get an episode put together. So guys, when we did the last episode, we were coming off of back-to-back losses to Kansas City, but here we are, how fortunes turn so quickly, two fantastic performances under Peter Luxane, uh, 2 nothing over LA at home, and then last night's 3-1 bashing of the broccoli. It's fun. Winning is fun, Buzz. Yeah, winning is fun. Uh, it's it's It's... You can see it in the players. You know, they're having fun. You can tell that uh, the, the fans are having fun. You know, scoring goals is fun, even if you don't win them all. Scoring goals is more fun. So uh, things are things are looking up in terms of uh, positivity around the team, and I'm sure everyone feels good about the direction things are going. How much of uh, winning two games at home versus losing two games on the road is just that? H- home playing on the road versus playing at home? Oh, a lot. Uh, so yeah, probably, probably most of it actually. Um, you know, you, you saw a team like LA Galaxy, who handled Dallas pretty easily in their place you know, a little while back, and then they come to Dallas and struggle mightily. Uh, you know, they were tired, but so was Dallas. So um, I think everybody knows that the home field advantage in MLS is worth about seventy five percent. You know, and and it's clear that um, you know, and on their turf, they have a pretty demanding home field advantage. Um, but they're going to need that if they're going to actually make a run at this thing. The math is plausible. It's not likely, but, uh, you know, it's, it's going to take probably winning all their home games. So um, they're going to feel good about that part. And then they can, if they can figure out how to do something on the road, maybe they'll give them a chance. Dan, you've been one of the guys that's been entrusted with going to the postgame press conferences and talking to the guys in the locker room. What is Has there been a significant shift in the vibe within the ranks uh, uh, since Peter took over? Uh, it's kind of hard to say because they've been winning more. Winning breeds a happier locker room, right? Um, but And just the, the two coaches, they're kind of chalk and cheese and how they approach things. Uh, Luke sounds very passionate when he talks, very kind of upbeat and taking those messages. Whereas, yeah, Nico Estevez, I think there was always a a reluctance, a hesitancy when he when he spoke, uh, which kind of translated to the kind of football where it was like, you know, try not to lose, try to grind out the points. Whereas, you know, I think Luke Sound would uh, take a win and a couple of losses to get three points over three draws. Interesting. So, uh, Buzz, there was a conversation going on in your Discord earlier today about what, it, why, uh, knowing what we know now with uh, Peter playing this kind of like let let the guys off the leash style. What 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 was the mental thinking on Estevez's part? I mean, do we have any more thoughts? I mean, we've talked about this endlessly. 
But what is really the difference uh, in the mental thinking, not the actual tactics itself, but why are these two guys operating this exact same group of guys in totally different ways and getting totally different results? Well, it, it, in a way, it's a, it is a vaguely tactical thing, but it, it has to do with, um, you know, freedom of expression. You know, the Coach Nico Savas was a very rigid defensive system, you know, very disciplined system. Uh, requiring guys to be in certain parts of the field and cover certain parts of the field. And um, Pierre Luxane is giving guys freedom to express themselves and freedom to go forward and freedom to p- try things. Um, you know, on the on the other side, of course, they do give up more goals because of that. But people like to play. They like to try and play. Nobody wants to sit back and play super defensive all the time. That's not fun, you know. And, and, and I honestly think, you know, the familiarity with playing forward at the back, too, it, it's not that it's a change to a system that works – better in general terms through the back is perfectly fine system but if you're not familiar with it not comfortable with it and you feel like you're being forced into it and players have been forced into roles they don't really do um, that also could create a really negative mentality for you and a really negative space and a really negative way of playing so you know everything has changed for the better under Peter like saying in the sense of like what players like and do and feel comfortable with and they feel free with and it really is expressing itself in the way they play and, and plus too there's you know, you do have players that are that are new every season, and so it takes some time to get together. And we're seeing guys come to life at mid-season, and some of that may just be their personal development as much as it is the coaching change. So, Buzz, it's like I said, it's fun to win. Is there any kind of continued uh, growth or development in the quality of what uh, Peter has got this team doing versus Estevez in terms of tactics and style? And I'm going to ask the same question I asked you last week. How much of it is a change in tactics and how much of it is just simply guys playing good, well, up to snuff and is as expected? Well, I think the change in tactic that's um, that's helped a lot is the – it really comes back to what the the answer was partially in the previous question, which is this willingness to play, this willingness to be free and let guys try things. You know, when, when guys think the coach has the confidence to express themselves and guys have the confidence to, to go at people and attempt things, you know, they're going to feel good about themselves. Um, you know, the, the way this coach is using um, flexible shapes for certain players, like guys that are experienced and know what they're doing are allowed to play differently than guys that are, um, you know, more uh, undeveloped and, and, and not as perhaps soccer savvy. But it's it's not just that, too, because he also is letting guys like Logan Farrington, who are coming into his own play, a really uh, progressive, adaptable, flexible game. So um, I think across the board, it, it, you know, it, it's not as – other than the giant shift more to a back four than a back three, the way they're playing is not all that different. You know, it's, it's still – uh, it has a vertical component that wasn't there before, but there was still this 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 a desire to take advantage of mistakes and and um, counter not counter attack but transition quickly. Uh, it still is about high percentage shooting on goal. That's still really important. So uh, you know it's still the same set of players. So it, it's mostly about I think confidence and and being comfortable and, uh, and and people buying in and being willing to express and 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 play in a. In a way, and if you're talking about like how you get a team that goes from not performing well, you know, with the same group of players, it's, it's almost always going to be about mentality, really, because you, you you didn't flip a switch and all of a sudden guys are great. That's not how that works. Last night, uh, Pierre Luxan's talking after the game, and one of the things he said was about kind of bringing things back to the FC Dallas style, um, trying to find guys in better positions. Uh, he talked about kind of the the adaptation, allowing players to breathe a little bit and kind of learn to read the game better um i'd asked him about kind of the passiveness in in much of the uh of the austin game and and that was kind of his take as you know they were trying things they just weren't necessarily succeeding in those but they were kind of their read of the situation was to drop back a little bit absorb that pressure kind of hearkening back to i guess his time playing for fc dallas and and coaching under Oscar Pereira as well. Well, whatever it is, it's inter- more entertaining to watch, and we've talked about this a lot, that what we're getting now, whether it ends up uh, making a, a run to the playoffs or not, is really not important. It's just it's more entertaining. It's it's not boring, and uh, the team has a little bit of uh, fun to them, and, and I think that's great. Uh, let's uh, I, As fun as it is to 
uh, kind of give Austin a pat on the head and send them back down I-35. The the big win of this particular episode is the win over the Galaxy, which were a, a team that were on a really good run in the league. And Dallas, Buzz, I think you probably have quite a different, uh, quite a set of things you want to talk about when it comes specifically to beating and actually, you know, shutting LA out at home to nothing. Yeah, you know, the that's a team that's incredibly offensively explosive. Um, you know, what the, Luke Sane even uh, rotated a little bit. You know, Ariola didn't start that game. You know, it, it, it's it was uh, it was really interesting to see. You know, it's hard to really specifically target what happened um, tactically that changed. You know, Dallas didn't particularly play a very different system than they played before. They're, they're using this this outside back flexibility. You know, where where in that game, um, you know, Junka got a start at. Uh, left center back and Tuomasi was on the right, you know, and and Tuomasi slid back into that back outside back, and then he slid forward into midfield. And those and Jukin would occasionally, occasionally do the same thing on the other side, even though he was more of a center back than an outside back. So that flexibility is really exciting, you know. But the biggest thing really was um, Er Mindy um, being able to mostly um, contain Puig. I mean, that's that's a player that's explosively talented and can can really just rip teams apart. Um, you know, and if you can, you can contain him, and you can contain um, Pencil, and you can contain Peck, who has that ability to cut in from the wing and is so dangerous. I mean, they got some really explosive, awesome players. And uh, in order to, to to contain that team, while not playing in the Nico Estevez sit back defensive shell, and while playing in a way where you got opportunities and playing in a way where you were able to score goals, and that's really exciting. You know, that's that's it's such a different. Um, belief and, and mentality in this team that they were able to do that. Uh, you know, and yes, again, part of it is home field advantage, but it's not all that. You know, the every single game so far under Coach Luxane, or particularly the last three or four, there's been a dramatic shift in the second half. You know, something he's doing in the locker room, whether it be a tactical shift or whether it's just a motivational shift. You know, this team really is coming out and performing in the second half. And it's been in the nature to be that way all season anyway, but to see him do it again and again and again. Uh, under this coach is really exciting. What must I would love to? Well, let me put it this way: I'd love to be a fly on the uh, Estevez household wall as he watches these games, and must wonder what he. <laughs> I, I I just I can't imagine what he must be thinking as he watches all of this. Well, the biggest one for me is he must think that he should have not done the the back three. I mean, I honestly wonder if if he would have played a back four at the beginning of the season if the comfort level would have been there, you know, would they have won a couple more games? Would, would that, would the, would those few points have been enough for him to not lose his gig, you know, and, and his utter belief that that was absolutely the very best way to go, I think in the end cost him his job. And so that might be his biggest regret. Not, not that he wants to change the way he coaches or his, the way he believes the team should play, but that, that tactical shift that just put his team in such a bad way at, to start the season, uh, in the end, you know, because one or two games really might have made a difference, you know, because you'd have been looking at being just a point or two out of the playoffs and really felt like you had a shot versus like where you were when you got a can, which was like 10 or 12, I think it was at the time off the top of my head. So that's probably the biggest thing I bet he's doing is sitting back and thinking maybe I, that was the wrong. Then again, maybe he's just got completely self believe to do the right thing. So it's so hard to say, honestly. I think one of the, uh, Biggest things to come out of this is the lesson about the the danger of uh, draws. Uh, you know, I think sometimes people get lulled into a sense of getting a draw on the road is a good thing. And and I, Dan, who is it that said you can draw yourself to death? What is it? Was maybe it was El Jefe? That was his. Quote. Was El Jefe? Yeah. Who's it was? Um, yeah, and and that's such a really smart thing because that one point, the different. You know, <laughs> one win is better than. Uh, than two draws and 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 what I think in my observation is and maybe Dan yours is the same is that uh, uh, Luxane's willingness to let this team try to score goals and boy if they scored goals I, I think I'm counting what is it 19 league goals uh, and I think it's 21 if you count the Open Cup game since he's taken over and his willingness to let this team score goals has paid off Yet, they also tend to allow a lot of goals. Uh, it's just working out for him, and I think that's the big difference between grinding out ties and, and actually letting the team try to win. 
No, for sure. I, I think uh, Garrett Meltzer had put a thing out said it was t- averaging two point four goals per game. I mean, that's that's a solid return for any team, let alone one that you know uh, a month ago we were like they have no shot at the playoffs whatsoever. It's uh, yeah. you know, and I think you know, you know, when you play right, it's it's easier to kind of pick yourself up in a game where you concede a goal to go two two than it is, you know conceding one nil in the first i don't know 20 minutes it, it's just you know you've got that boost you you know you can go forward you believe you can kind of get it done it's not okay well we got to grind the rest of this out for the rest of the game and uh, you know the rules right now in mls it it doesn't favor playing for a draw on the road the first tiebreaker is most wins right it is interesting because I thought last night's Austin game was uh, a good reflection so far of the Peter era where, you know, the goal, the, the team goes ahead, scores a goal, and then immediately turns turns around and gives up the goal uh, to end up 1-1 and it, everything, you know, the highs and lows, but then continues to fight and gets the, the great opportunity, the PK, which we'll talk about that whole deal here in a few minutes. <laughs> Ariel, is, that, yeah, that really good goal to start off with, really nice sequence, very direct play, open. I loved it. All of that was great. And then, of course, just six minutes later, uh, a, just the worst uh, calamity of defending I have seen in quite some time. I still haven't figured out how all of those guys got that so wrong, and Zardes is standing wide open. By the way, that was a really nice finish by Zardes uh, to tie it 1-1. Uh, but then the team just kept doing its thing and working to try to win the game uh, and got the PK and made it 2-1. We'll learn. We'll talk more about that incident here in a little bit. Um, but that's just as a good summary, I think, of, of the change in attitude buzz and and that is a lot that that alone is worth getting up and watching the team i suppose yeah listen th- we talked a while back about how this was a team of dudes and it still is for the most part you know we talked a lot about game after game we were watching there's just some guys out there playing and a lot of those guys are mostly still playing the same way they're always playing like of the dudes the only one that really has elevated himself is seeking and Sebling. Uh, who has great belief from this coach when he didn't from uh, the previous coach, despite that coach being the one who sort of found him. Uh, but the other thing that has happened is that some guys that you don't want to be dudes, um, Paul Areola is playing the best soccer of this season. I think Sebastian Legette's playing his best soccer of his time here in Dallas. Um, for Logan Farrington has become this incredible catalyst of, of uh, movement up front that's tearing apart uh, the defense is in a, in a Jason Christ kind of way. Petr Musa is a center channel striker, but the balls are coming into him uh, in a little more space than they were before. You know, it, the guys, that we, so we've been talking about this all year, special players need to elevate in order to win games in MLS. And the Dallas special players, not the ones that were hurt, of course, but the ones that have been playing, hadn't been doing that until Luxane took over. And now did he convince them to do it? Did they have self belief, or did they just decide to do it after they got their bad play, got their coach fired? Man, it's hard to say. But um, you know, when you have when you have guys that are supposed to be better, doing better things, they can bring the whole team along with them. And all of a sudden, the dudes are finishing out games and and getting wins. It's 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 exciting to see it happen. All right, Dan, you were there last night. Why don't you tell everybody the behind-the-scenes story of the red card incident and the penalty kick and all that stuff and what actually went down or what you learned after the game? Yeah, so uh, we were talking with uh, Coase in the locker room after the game. You know, once the... uh... Wait, wait, did you just call him Coase? Yeah. Are you, like, on nickname-level term with him now? No, that's what people call him Coase Tafari. Okay, I'm just saying, you know... It just seemed very casual. I will call him Mr. Tafari. Uh, <laughs> I guess it would be Mr. Burgess, but he doesn't go by Burgess. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, sp- you know, obviously, media speaking with Nkosi Tafari after the game. Uh, you know, recorders go off because, you know, you're not getting quotes anymore. Uh, actually, no, I'd asked him about the incident after. He kind of brushed it off. He's like, you know what? I- if they came to run at me, I don't know why. I, I-, I play the game. I finish the game, I go home. That's it. Um, the most Nikosa Tafari answer you can give to uh, a guy aggressively chasing you halfway across the field. Um, <laughs> but then he starts talking about the uh, the penalty. And 
you know, they they earn the, the penalty. Uh, Owen Wolf kind of clumsily handles, and Julio Cascante is going up to to Musa as he's waiting to take the kick, and he's saying some very very vulgar things about uh, his mother. <laughs> And uh, Drius, he's kind of following up with, ah, you're going to miss it, you're going to shank it, whatever else. Uh, Something in Spanish that I guess uh, Nkosi Tafare retorted in Spanish. Um, obviously, the, the first kick save, Steve comes off the line. Drusi and, and Cascante kind of, you know, go off at him again. They do again when the retake's about to happen. Musa immediately runs up to, I think it was Drusi, celebrates in his face. Uh, there is a brilliant steal. I think FC Dallas used it for the score graphic where Tafari is jumping in the air doing the moose thing <laughs> in either Drusi, I think it was Drusi's face. Um, just absolutely marvelous. Yeah, the picture of Tafari doing the more moose horns, neener, neener thing is, oh, it's is so childish and wonderful neener, neener. and awesome. It's it's the highlight of the season, frankly, so far. So then he runs back to the half while the other players are celebrating. Obviously, the Austin players follow Tafari. And you've got Cascante on a yellow at this point. So I think, I think uh, he said he was trying to bait him a little bit, see if he could get him a second yellow. And then he just sees a hand appear through this through this crowd of players. He didn't see Drusi, but then the hand comes and grips him around the neck, and he just says, "You'd better just take that armband off. You're done." And then <laughs> promptly drops to the floor. <laughs> Absolute king behavior. That is great. Yes, uh, and I let me just side comment. I thought it was really telling. And also entertaining that Driussi knew that he was actually the assailant and allowed his teammate to get sent off. He didn't even say a word. He let his teammate get sent off on his behalf and just sat and waited to see if VAR would pick up on it. And of course it did. If you're Josh Wolf, which one of those two would you prefer to see sent off? Sure, I'm with you. I get it. I just I, I wonder how Castante felt about that, thinking that he it suddenly had to... Uh, uh, take the take the long walk on somebody else's behalf for something he didn't do. I'd be I don't know how I'd feel about yeah, that. Sp- but supposedly, uh, he'd actually got back into the locker room. He started and was you know was kind of taking a breather before getting showered and changed, and and they had to send someone back in to get him because the oh yeah took on, that much time on TV. You could actually see, and then Steve actually uh, Steve and Owen commented on this that. He, they were like, wow, the uh, Austin assistant coach or trainer is literally sprinting 150 yards to go get <laughs> Castante back. Hopefully he hasn't undressed and already in the shower. So that was all very, very funny and entertaining. I will say this about the, you know, that incident and then everything after. Um, you, you've both been down in those locker rooms, right? It's one long hallway. The FC Dallas players actually walk past the away locker rooms to leave the stadium. They... Uh, they had a set of fire doors down the middle. It's the first time I've ever seen them close. Security would not let anyone go in between. Really? Ah, proper Derby, Dan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I was like, say more than that. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, you know, um, <sighs> the the players are up for it. There is, you know, there is some uh, genuine hatred on on their side. <laughs> yes it was fun it was that uh, look uh, I, but hey this... if if you want to call it a, if you want to call it a rivalry from day one it's not a rivalry from day one you have to build some hate and if that's the hate if that's the Dima Kovalenko breaking legs moment cool great call it a rivalry yeah that's a good point yeah maybe that's the this is the kind of game that actually develops uh uh some emotion between these two teams because it it really hasn't been much of anything up until this point. I don't care about that stupid trophy no. uh Austin can gladly just take that home as a consolation prize as far as I'm concerned so um i you know i last night was great and this is not a good season it's not been a fun season, but those are the kind of moments that uh you know you'll look back on and you know, maybe, maybe, uh, Buzz, does that, is that list quality? Is that, is that, is that moment deserving of being on the list? 
No, no, because the, the listers the ba- are bad things, not good things. Oh, okay. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, uh, Moose Antler Neener Neener is pretty farting hilarious in my book. <laughs> can I give you uh, two quick updates on, on that game? Um, yes. So Peta Musa was sick most of the week. Uh, you may have seen Instagram. A couple of the players called it flu game. Um, he, he was not uh, in the best of ways after the game, but... Uh, I think that was his fifth booking of the season, so he actually gets to miss New England anyway. Um, Iara Mendy uh, has been carrying an ankle injury for a few weeks. He they gave him a little fitness test before the warm up. He, you know, they decided against playing him. So the initial lineup went in with Iara Mendy, Iara Mendy starting. Ariola knew that there was a good chance he would have to play that more advanced role and Tumasi come back into the team. Uh, but they only kind of confirmed it two minutes before the warm-ups actually happened. That's why it was mm. such a late rush with it. But I any, think Coates, any word long term on Laura Mendy's ankle? Uh, God, I want to say he said. I asked him about it. I want to say he said he'd be good to go Saturday. But let me double check before you quote me on that. Uh, Wait, did you the, write it down? No, I, I have a transcript from the press conference. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, wow, uh, journalism and stuff. Yeah, um, it was. Fu- Let's see. We have another. <laughs> we have another game. Very important game on Saturday. So that was it. it. Was just fine to rest and be ready for New England. And on the subject to rest. Oh, that was me saying on the subject to rest. But yeah, he should be good for Saturday. All right, very good. Uh, yeah, six huge points. It puts Dallas, uh, ironically, a point behind Austin. Um, at uh, and, and also a point behind the playoffs. Austin is in 10th, uh, just out of the playoffs on goal differential behind Minnesota, and Dallas is a point behind both of those teams. Although, ironically, believe it or not, I can't believe I'm saying this, Dallas actually has a better goal differential than Minnesota or Austin. They're at minus 3 and num- minus 9, respectively. Dallas is up to minus 1 on goal. How bad had goal differential gotten with this team at one point? It was it was what? Are they down? To, were they down to like minus ten at one point? I don't remember. I thought it was worse than. Can I give you an even more mind blowing stat? Uh, yes, please do. Right, train wreck of a season. Right, even to this point, off the playoffs, you know, not not wonderful. FC Dallas has the joint second best home record in the Western Conference. Wow, that is remarkable. One win behind LAFC. Okay, so somebody asked this question on the Discord yesterday, and I don't know the answer to this. Has an MLS team ever made it to the playoffs without a single road win? I don't think so, because you remember Steve Davis was talking about there's only like four teams that have ever had a season with no win or something like that. I mean, it's a very limited number of teams. Yeah, it's like a, he said that it's some. It's a list of like the worst teams of all time. <laughs> I didn't go look up what it was, but I remember him talking about it being an absolute <laughs> nightmare. So it's like I can't imagine that anybody has done it. Yeah, it would be really. It would be almost unbelievable to think that Dallas somehow manages the rest of this way. And Buzz, you tweeted out some numbers about this. I'll let you get into yeah. it. But the idea that Dallas qualifies for the playoffs without winning a road game, which they have a lot of coming up, just seems uh, very improbable. Yeah, you probably need, you know, approximately 44 points. Now, of course, there's a little bit of variance there. Maybe it's 43, or maybe if there could be a crazy alignment where it's more like 42. But, you know, without fail, like the last three or four seasons, if you go back and look, that's been the mark um, for the the Western Conference. Um, And if you look at Dallas's remaining home games, they, they need 15 more points, basically, to get that number, give or take. And they have 10 games left, but only four of those games are at home. And consider that you're at home. You have Colorado, who's your bogey team, and is pretty good. LAFC, who's really good. Orlando, you know, Oscar, great, awesome. Sporting Kansas City on the last game of the season. Well, they would love to wreck your season. So those are not four easy wins, and you pretty much got to get them. You know, every one of those you drop is a win you got to get on the road. And you already probably need a win on the road. And you're going to have to – this weekend of the Revs is a shot. And then you go to D.C., you go to Vancouver, that's a long way to go. You go to RSL, we'll forget that. Maybe you go to San Jose, and then you also got to go to Portland. So, listen, if they can pull it off, they'll have well earned it because that is not going to be easy. 
just those four home games alone are a whip. I mean, you could easily lose all four of those home games, to be honest. Colorado, LAFC, Orlando, and Sporting on the last game of the season. Sporting, I mean, that's Mm -hmm. they could be right there with you for that spot, and they love to ruin your season, and so does Colorado. So, and LAFC is not at the end; it's in the middle, so they'll still be playing hard. So, like, look, is it doable? Sure. Is this team playing great? Absolutely. If they do it, they're going to really have earned it. Uh, and and they've done so far what they got to do is win the home games they've had so far. And so if you just keep doing that. Take them one game at a time and see what happens. Go up there to the Revs who are reeling with injuries in a horrible season and see if you can get a win there uh, and, and check that off your list and, and give yourself a chance. What else can you do but give yourself a chance? Yeah, for sure. And the way they've been playing, that that seems like the best path to doing that. Now, also yeah. throwing the throwing this uh, into the mix, yesterday or the day before, Alan Velasco posted on Instagram a picture of him and full kit wanker uh, <laughs> with some sort of hopeful line of emojis. Uh, and it does beg the question is, does anybody have any idea on what the timeline is for Velasco's return to this team? Well, it's been a couple of weeks since I've been out training for various, uh, you know, scheduling reasons or whatever. And um, honestly, we don't know, <laughs> you know, because look, when you're talking about the final stages of an ACL, like Giovanni Jesus should have been ahead of him by about two months, right? And we haven't seen Giovanni back yet, right? He should have been June, probably, and now we're halfway through July. Now, Alan, we should have been maybe you know, late July or sometime in August, possibly, but we just don't know, you know, you know, can you have like the, the, the word was that Giovanni had some scar tissue cleanup or whatever, and, you know, what happens when Alan gets out there the first time it cuts hard and pops a piece of scar tissue, you know, you just don't know. I, I don't think you can count on, you know, when that's going to come, you know, you just have to accept if it happens, it happens, you know, and it, it'll be an added bonus. Consider it like getting a player in the window, hmm. if you will, that you weren't expecting. So, you know, maybe maybe with Lee's Cup around the corner, maybe the the best choice is just to leave him out of Lee's Cup no matter what, and hope that he'll come back for the the, the, the you know basically a month from now, August twentieth, I think, is the next time, not including this New England game, the next time they have a league game. So maybe that's the whole full target. Cross our fingers. Yeah. All right. Well, that's an interesting uh, thought. I mean, I have I I think we all agreed from the onset our hope for anything out of Velasco was pretty uh, limited for this season or uh, Giovane or Giovanni uh, as well, just because c- coming off ACLs is tough. What I do think is interesting is, you know, the timeline on Jesus Ferreira's return to this team uh, and how that impacts the roster. Um, because Farrington is playing so well. But the one player I do want to take a minute to talk about, and you mentioned this earlier, Buzz, is a guy who, you know, I was pretty much done with. I just, and I'm, and I, and while I said I'm, my, my, uh, opinion of him hasn't changed dramatically, but I have appreciated how much better he's played is in Sebling. And I don't know what has clicked with him, but he has played better. Now at the end of the Austin game last night, he went reverted back to being a turnover machine. Um, but by and large, he has been one of the pieces to this that has helped um, uh, look uh, you know, garner a lot of points. Yeah, a lot of that is just confidence from the coach, but a, a big chunk of it is that they're putting him in a different position. Um, under uh, Coach Peter, he's playing in the high Alan Velasco underneath 10 role, um, where when he makes a turnover there, it doesn't hurt the team. Um, last night, he tried to kill the team late in the game right before that last goal uh, with a with a horrible dribble into three players kind of moment that would have just and it, it re- resulted in a turnover and then times passed and really killed them. In this particular moment, it didn't, and they happen to get a goal immediately afterwards. But that's the main difference. It's like where he's still the same player he was, but now they have some confidence in him. And that by moving him higher up the field, some of the passes that before were not really doing much, but maybe linking out of the back a little, are now getting guys going over the top on the the onsa miss, for example. Um, And and the turnovers aren't hurting near as bad. All right, so let's talk about some other player stuff. Uh, It is the transfer window, and everybody is poking Dan Hunt with a stick, saying, come on, do something. And lo and behold, it does appear that they are about to do something, but everybody prepare yourself not to be too overwhelmed as the player that they have been linked to is a 25-year-old player uh, from Angola uh, named Manuel Cafumanga. And he goes by the name 
show. And he's currently <laughs> yeah. playing, yes, boys and girls, in the Israeli League. I, I, I went and looked at his uh, pathway, and I want to see if you recognize the names of any of these clubs. Okay, the first one is Lille, the French team, Lille yes. B specifically, right? Okay, how about if we link that with Boa Vista, the next mm-hmm. place he was at? How about if we link in the club Ludo Goretz? Does that name mean anything to you guys? Hell yeah. If you Google... Bav- yeah. Uh, Bavarian, Bulgarian butcher. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you Google that in FC Dallas, you get Anton Ned Yalkov sale. So... To me, some of these same sort of teams sniffing around again and again makes me feel like this is uh, sort of a – there's some relationships here. There's some some connections here that are kind of coming to like, you know, hey, I'm in a world of need for a midfielder. Hook a brother up and give me a guy. And here was a guy. So, you know – you lose Liam Ethan Frazier for you know two months or whatever it is, and Liam Frazier and you lose two months, and then holy crap, I'm running out of mids. No holding mids. Nolan Norris is going to the uh, U20 Championship. What am I going to do? You know what? I'll call my dudes. Uh, and I think you know sometimes when you see these same clubs popping up in a background again and again with various. I mean, if you look at just those three names alone, you can think back of four or five different players from this club that have had some sort of connection or something with some of those names and it's a small world sometimes yeah it's it's weird and i again i always i i I feel like i'm beating a dead horse with this joke but this is an entire planet of soccer players and i can't figure out why (laughs) for a for for a guy who apparently has all these amazing south american contacts how you're going to surface a defensive mid or a mid a center midfielder from the israeli league like it was funny i was watching ansa play last night and I don't know, he may be the nicest man in the entire world, but I swear Dallas found him in the DFW area players looking for a team Facebook group um, and and signed him from there because that guy is awful. His decision making is poor, everything about that guy. And, and so when I and maybe that's not fair to put that on this dude, but it does make you wonder what kind of quality they think they're going to get when they just sign another guy from the Israeli league. Well, the thing is, is that um, Maccabee paid 1.2 million euros for him, according to the transfer market. So if they're letting him out of his deal like a year later, you know, of a, for, yeah. or, or is Dallas paying a multi-million or even a million or what, whatever they're paying for this guy? You know, granted, the best we have to go on is maybe like a YouTube video or whatever. So um, hopefully someone scouted him, but like obviously a big factor here is going to be what they paid to get him. And like I said, with those lists of clubs, maybe this is a favor kind of deal with something coming back. I mean, Bo owes them money. I mean, who hell knows, right? So uh, this is a guy that's so off the radar that it's, it's like until we see him train or play, it's like we're going to have no idea what Dallas is getting here. Granted, it's a position they're desperate for bodies in. I just hope that they're not going to handcuff themselves here going forward past the end of this season with this guy if he turns out to stink. You know, they already got a couple bodies in that spot that are just sort of mediocre to begin with, you know, or or hurt, and you have no idea if they're ever going to be the same. So hopefully they're not throwing money in a, at, a, at something that's going to really kill them. Well, I guess the question I have is, is this guy markedly better than Carl Sante? Man, I, I, who knows? The, 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 my, my problem with Carl Sante is that as a holding mid, I never really thought he was going to make it to MLS. And they started playing him as a center back, and I got really excited. I had multiple conversations with Nico Seves about how, man, this guy's a center back might have some. This will be kind of fun. And when they signed him, coach was like, yeah, this will be good. We're going to use him as a center back. And every game he's played since then, he's been a holding mid. I'm like, that's not a dude that I was excited about in MLS as a holding mid. So... I assume this guy must be better than Carl Sante as a holding mid. I'd hope so. I mean, um, I don't know. He it better be. It makes you wonder. Uh, I, yeah. Um, Lord, what a what a weird signing if that is, in fact, how it plays out. And it does yeah. bother me when the guy has the nickname Show, and that's what he goes by. And, and, and the idea that we're going to have a guy wearing a, uh, a Dallas shirt with just the word Show on the back. Hey, we had Tesh Show. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't get to use Tesho, remember? Fair, yeah. 
seeing a guy wearing a Dallas shirt with the word show on the back is just going to probably make my old man uh, <laughs> self bonkers. Um, Are you going to yell at clouds? Yeah, I may go yell at clouds. <laughs> well, uh, if it's any consolation, uh, earlier in the year he did play against Fiorentina. Um, he he did get sent off in that game, so <laughs> you know. Do we know how big he is or anything? Is he a little dude, a big dude? Has anybody seen any video of him? He is five eleven. Okay, fair height. Well, that's all right then. But yeah. I mean. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously they didn't anticipate Liam Frazier going down and being out for the season. So if this is a rush signing, uh, you know, I mean, he is he is playing constantly for uh, for Maccabi Haifa. He is a ninety minute every game six for the Angolan national team. Is it a sexy signing? No, but I mean, nor was Liam Frazier. Did he play in the African Cup of Nations? He did. He played. Uh, he started four to five games for them. I like it a lot better if it's alone. Uh, supposedly, it is alone. Okay, that makes me feel better too. Because uh, Jose Oliveras uh, had tweeted something out earlier about loan. Uh, I think it was a loan to buy uh, announced after the New England game. Hmm. Okay. Well, all this suspicion and assumption that he sucks is uh, ho- hopefully uh, I'm wrong. And uh, show Manuel Kafumana uh, turns out to be exactly what we needed to finish out the season. Um, let's see. The other big news this week we got today, the new roster rules, MLS roster rules, finally came out today. Uh, we did learn prior to this that the second buyout uh, that we had heard rumored to be as part of this new slate of rules did not happen. So you won't be able to buy out Paxton's cl- uh, contract or uh, Velasco, you know, whatever. We can't do two in one season, but there are some changes. Um, I guess they're less Byzantine buzz. I don't know. I, <laughs> uh-huh. I think we there. there's one deal in there where there's a, every team gets to have a path. It's like choose your own adventure book, uh, except in yeah. the MLS rules. And it's very, very clear to me which of these two uh, Dan Hunt's going to walk down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I swear Clark Hunt wrote this rule. Listen, um, it, the, 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 short, the short of it is that you can either have three DPs and three U22 initiatives, or you can have two DBs, four U22 initiatives, and $2 million in buy-down money. And you guys know how much the Hunts like to buy down those guys and get, like, rather than having one $15 million DP, they like to have eight $1 million DPs. So that rule, like, if, if you follow that that rule and you and you use the two four setup for what you can assume is going to be for FC Dallas. You can look at the roster right now. The ones you you can't buy down Musa or Ferreira, but you can buy down like you already are Paul Ariola, and you can buy down Paxson. And you can buy down Legette. Those are the other three. And the one you, this is a question mark is Alan Velasco. You know, can you buy him down? Um, and you can. You know the reason you wouldn't want to was because the the deep the young DP counts less than a than a full DP. But if by buying him down, you basically means he's not a DP, and thus you get two million dollars in your pocket, and you get an extra U twenty two slot. So why wouldn't you do that then? So you can just see like if you go look at the money for SC Dallas, you can see that their roster is basically set up. We'll go look at the salaries, and you can see that it's set up to take advantage of the two four version. You know, and this is how this club likes to operate anyway with all these buy downs. So while they haven't said officially, we can all pretty much guess which way they're going to go, you know, because this is the way they like to do business. They'd rather get these younger guys and see if they can develop and, and, and sell. You know, that's the plan. So um, I'll be stunned if it's not any version but the two versus four. All right. Well, uh, we'll see how all that plays out. So these all take uh, these all start this uh, this window, correct? Is that what I'm to understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a and there's a prorated um, you know value of this, that, and the other thing based on half season. Like the details of that are not worth digging digging into really in a consequential way. Okay. 
Awesome. All right. So looking forward, Dallas does travel to New England this weekend, as uh, Buzz and or Dan mentioned. Uh, the Revolution are a mess. Um, they have a lot of injury issues. Uh, it's a insane. In fact, that may be. I don't know if you guys saw that list from the other day. That's one of the Twelve worst players. Uh, lists I've seen in some time, and that's a remarkable for this league before they get into League's Cup on the 27th, starting off with the road trip to St. Louis, and then Juarez comes to Dallas on the 31st. Uh, and then, obviously, the break, depending on how Dallas does, uh, they may have some time off to heal up or whatever, or, or maybe progress for far into the tournament. The messy list tournament, I guess, is what we're uh, assuming is going to happen at this point with his ankle injury. Uh, yep. doesn't pick back up until that game against D.C. on the 24th. Uh, anything else that we want to get into before we wrap this thing up since uh, we're dealing with the Internet issues? I think the only thing that came to mind for me was uh, you know Dallas Trinity continuing to sign players. Just uh, they announced uh, Chioma Ibagagi the other day, former Real Madrid, Houston Dash, Orlando Pride, Arsenal, Tottenham. Uh, you name it. She's played there from Capel, capped by England, U.S. Youth National Team player. Uh, sat out for a little bit with some uh, some health issues, and good to see her back playing and. Honestly, that's to me, that's by far and away their biggest sign in today. Yeah, I saw a video of them at training today. Do you know where they're training at? Because I couldn't identify where that field was. I don't. They actually had some, uh, interesting, they had some social media people, uh, kind of shadowing FC Dallas people to kind of, you know, figure out the game day logistics and all that. Uh, hmm. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to see kind of what they do. Uh, but no, I, I, I couldn't identify where they were training. All right. When's their first game? August what? August 18th. They're August. away to somebody. And then they're home <laughs> September 7th, I think, for DC Power. DC Power. All right. Very good. Uh, all right, Buzz. Well, I hope the vacation, the walkabout with the family is going well, sir. Oh, swimmingly. Yeah, of course. All right. Uh, where are you headed, by the way? Same place as always, northern Idaho, where my wife's family has a place up there, a cabin on a lake. Wait, didn't I see during the trip that you were in Arkansas? Yes. Well, my wife was working in um, for a camp in Rockford, Illinois. So I cut uh, uh, east and up a little bit to Rockford, Illinois, picked her up, and then we went across. Um, you know, I, I stopped by Field of Dreams, took a picture there, and then we now we're going across Wyoming and Montana to up to where uh, her family's got a place. All right. Very, Very good. Cool. That is excellent. Um, I don't think I've got anything else I want to mention. I'm trying to make sure look at my notes. Um, no, I think it all looks good. Uh, all right. Well, boys, uh, congratulations on the win. Feels good. We'll see how things roll. And um, thank you so much, Dan. Great to talk to you as always. Thank you. And likewise. Uh, and uh, Buzz, I appreciate you uh, making the effort. Hopefully editing this doesn't turn, uh, isn't <laughs> your, uh, your demise. Yeah, I'm, I may be sitting here for hours trying to get this thing cut together, but hopefully we can get it up for everybody tonight. Oh, hey, just real quick, because this, this is related. We did also hear the devastating and heartbreaking news today that Zach Crane of D Magazine unexpectedly died on Monday. He's, he was found uh, dead in his home. Um, and that's important to FC Dallas fans because Zach is one of the media members locally who did put out effort in covering this team for, for D Magazine. So uh, condolences to everybody at D Magazine, Zach's family, and all of his friends, many of which are people I know. Uh, it was uh, totally out of the blue, unexpected, and a real tragedy. So rest in peace, Zach Crane. Third Degree, the podcast is brought to you by the Lindstrom Law Firm for Wills, Trust, Probates, and Business Law. Call 469 469- Five one five two five five nine, or visit lindstromlawfirm.com for a free consultation. Thank you, FC Dallas Curious fans. Enjoy the win. Enjoy the ride. Let's see how this goes. And we will talk to you next week on another episode of Third Degree, the podcast. King Kos is back. Oh. Third Degree, the Third Degree Net Podcast. Third Degree, the Third Degree Net Podcast. Third Degree. Third degree, the third degree never can.